Well, it's finally arrived. The video is sponsored by Maso, makers of the Maso CNC controller. Great hardware and software package to run your machine with no PC required. Hello fellow CNC nuts and welcome. Today we'll be making this. It's a lithothane keyring. Basically a keyring with a personalised lithothane in the centre of it. For those who don't know what lithothanes are, they are engravings which when you shine light through from the back, really look impressive. And to help me do it, I'm going to be using this. What is it I hear you ask? Well, let's look in the box. Well, for the one or two of you that haven't figured it out by now, it's a Maso CNC controller. But why is it in a suitcase? Now that's a really interesting question. Just before Christmas, Jatinda of Maso asked me, would I be interested in joining his team to help provide support to Maso users, as well as shoot some video documentation? And I thought, yeah, I'd like to do that. So here I am four months later. Jat sent me a Maso unit so that I could learn how to use it, connect it up to my machine, and of course use it for shooting my videos. So I had to make it portable. There's no way I want to be coming out here every five minutes to reference it. And of course, I can't use it in my office to run this machine. So I decided the best idea was to wire it into this case. And in that case, I can keep things like the pendant, my mouse, even my keyboard. And of course, I can connect it to my Gecko G540 by simply plugging it in with this cable here. I've just wired it out to the various inputs and outputs on Maso here. Now for the spindle, I decided I would run that separately rather than through the G540 and it would run a lot better as well. So here, I put a plug that my spindle plugs into. My spindle was already set up to work on one of these plugs, so again, no great hassle there. Then, I had another one here, homing switches. Yes, you heard right, I added homing switches to my machine. So I've got one here on the X, the Z, and two of them on the Y, so it auto squares. Maso works a lot better when it has homing switches connected. Lastly, I've got here this red one, and that's for a tower light. I haven't connected that up yet, but that is the plan for that. So there you have it. The answer to why is this in a box, rather than connected actually to my machine, especially with winter coming on. I don't want to be coming out here any more than I have to. So, enough about this here. While I connect this up to my machine, not a particularly laborious task, why don't you pop inside and uh, have a look at how the files are generated to create the lithothane. So for this project, I'm going to be using Photo VCAR. It was the first software I brought from Vetric to use on my CNC machine. And it's excellent. It can give you really good results without too much effort really and what's more they look really impressive so if we pop into our software here first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load my image and here's a wee photo that my wife took of me when I was sitting on the couch one afternoon and uh, first thing we need to do is we need to set our material size so we'll come down here to our material size and uh, you can see I've set it to 30 millimeters by 40 millimeters. The normal image size of this one here is something about uh, 180 uh, millimeters by 240, but I've set the image in a 3 by 4 aspect ratio, and that's important for this particular project. So when I make it 30 millimeters, it comes out automatically as 40. Now, of course, I set that aspect ratio in some. Uh, photo editing software. I just use GIMP because it's free and um, you'll see I also put a black border on it. I think when you do that you get a much better finished uh, result. 
Now the next important thing is the origin point of this project and it's going to be the center of our material. That's important and our thickness is four and a half millimeters which is the thickness of our uh, cast acrylic here. Of course working in millimeters and we'll just apply that. So now we can move down to setting our parameters and I'm going to select a ball nose cutter of 0 0.5 millimeter diameter. Okay well look uh, don't tell them but I actually don't own a half millimeter ball nose cutter. What I'm going to be using is this here. It's a 30 degree engraving cutter with a broken tip. I've eyeballed it and it looks about half a millimeter across at the tip. The thing is these things break really easy but when they do they make really good cutters for cutting lithothanes. The great thing about them though is just listen to this that is a really hard plastic and cutting through this stuff is really hard going but once these here have that little broken tip on them they become stronger they can cut through this in one pass you don't need to do the roughing cut now another little hint for you is always leave the little rubber cover on these here until you absolutely have to remove it even when it's in the collet because there's nothing more joyous than managing to get the pointed bit up under your fingernail, under your cuticle, or simply running your hand across it and slicing your hand open. It's so easy to do. Even when these things are blunt, they are wickedly sharp and will do you a lot of damage. Okay, you, you better get back before he misses you. So the next setting I'm going to do is give a maximum carving depth and for that I'm choosing 3.7 millimeters. Now my material is 4.5 millimeters in thickness and I'm carving down to a maximum of 3.7 millimeters. That means that the thinnest this can go is 0 0.8 of a millimeter and that will be my white point. That will be the most light shining through my material here and the range from white to black will be from that 0 0.8 of a millimeter all the way up to 3.7 millimeters that gives me 2.9 millimeters of material that gives me my shading and you'll find that normally uh, it's very hard to pass light through this particular uh, cast acrylic uh, you really want uh, the white stuff, not the uh, not the sort of semi see-through stuff. Now, the next important setting we need to look at here is our line spacing, and I've set that to ten percent. Now, you can't use the slider to set that; you can only go from hundred to two hundred percent using the slider. You actually have to come in here and type ten. And that'll set that. Now, that automatically calculates for me here that I will have 990 lines, which is quite a lot of lines, but it's a very small picture. So that's going to give me uh, a lot of resolution. It also tells me the distance between the line is 0 0.05 of a millimeter. And it'll all do it in one pass. We come up here into the editing settings. You can see I've set the diameter of my cutter and I've just called the ball nose cutter. Yes, I know it's a V cutter. And something else you can do is you can always get a diamond uh, stone because they're very cheap these days and round the tip of that broken cutter over if you wish. Or even just take a new cutter and round it over. A new cutter has a tip a distance of about 0 0.2 millimeters. So uh, you can see here one of the important settings is the uh, uh, pass depth and I've set that to 3.7 millimeters. You want to make sure that it is equal to or more than your maximum carve depth. If you have it less it'll take two passes to do the final carve. I'm setting my spindle speed at 10,000 RPM 
my feed rate at 40 inches per minute, my plunge rate at 20 inches per minute, don't plunge in quickly into material, especially uh, something as hard as this. And I've just given it tool number one. Now another important thing here is this one here, the line angle. I've got 315 degrees. That may sound like a lot, but it's actually only 45 degrees and it will start from the bottom left corner and work its way across and up until it gets to this corner here. If I put 45 degrees, I think it starts from the top and works its way down towards the bottom. By starting here, if things go wrong, then I can just simply move it away a little bit and restart. Whereas if I start up here and start cutting back towards uh, uh, the bottom of my material, then I'm probably going to waste all that material should things go wrong. Uh, I've also set it to invert light and dark areas. That's important. And uh, I haven't bothered increasing the contrast. The final setting is the rapid clearance gap, and that's how much the cutter will raise up out of the material as it moves from one area to the other. You don't want it too high, but you don't want it too low. I've got it set at 3, maybe I'll change that to uh, 1.5 millimeters. And again, just hit calculate. The final job is to go in here, preview, and uh, save. And this here is calculated, it'll take about 33 minutes to do the carving, and that's not too bad. I've set my uh, rapid rate at 16 inches per minute because I know that uh, that's the maximum or the uh, starting speed of my z-axis, and that's pretty much going to uh, determine how fast this uh, cut will go. Uh, the z-axis does move a lot faster than that, but that's the starting speed. And really when it comes to cutting this sort of thing, the movements are so small, it never gets up any speed at all. So it comes up with 33 minutes. In actual fact, it ends up being 37. So that's pretty good. You select your post processor. In my case, I'm going to select Masso Millimeters. And I'm going to go Save Toolpath. And I'm going to call it Couch Potato. We can now take that file out of the workshop and put it on the machine. Now, if you're wondering how long it took to set the Masso up onto my machine, it took less than 60 seconds. Just take a look at this. So now that our lithophane is cut, it's time to look at the keyring cutout. So let's just pop into a spire and see what we've got. And here's our drawing. It may look a little bit complex, but really there's only two toolpaths in it. The first one is this one here. I'll just turn on the toolpaths I've already created. And this one here is a hole. We're going to cut a hole in it, and that will be for the split keyring to go through so that we can then attach our keys. The second one is this profile toolpath here around the outside and that will cut out our keyring shape giving us the uh, final look here and if we look at the 3D uh, rendering of it you can see what it will end up looking like. There's really nothing complex about this file at all. 
So the question is, what are these other shapes? I have this square here. Now that is our 30mm by 40mm lithophane that I created. And it's really only on the caring model to show where it actually sits in the great scheme of things so that I could then uh, draw the rest of the key ring around it. And finally, we have here this cross. Now this cross is actually at our X and Y zero point. But you'll notice it's not in the bottom left hand corner as sometimes it would be. And it's not in the actual center of the drawing which would be somewhere around here. If, uh, in, as you would have in normal uh, projects. But it is in the center of the square where our lithophane actually sits. So uh, it's important that you do not move your X and Y coordinates, simply load up this file and cut it. So why didn't I bring my Photo VCarve uh, project into Aspire here and add it to our model? Well, the real answer is there is no reason on this planet to actually do that. I only need to create this file once, and when I'm done, I can just use it for every little thing keyring I make. All I need to do is create the photo V carve, make sure it's 30 by 40 millimeters, make sure that the origin point is in the center of my lithophane and I'm ready to go. Once that's cut, I can simply grab this file, load it uh, into my control software and run it and it will cut out my project for me. In theory, I should never need to look at this file again. There's no reason to bring the photo VCarve image into here and create extra work for myself. Now the other question you might ask is why didn't I use Aspire to create this file? Because Aspire would work just as well. Well, I wanted to show how it can be done in photo VCarve. Not everybody can afford Aspire, so photo VCarve is a great way of making them. And people just love the look of lithophanes. They really are very impressive. You don't need to go out and learn 3D modeling to do this here. As long as you've got some uh, suitable plastic, in this case it's cast acrylic and it is the whitest cast acrylic I could find and basically under normal circumstances if you shine a light behind it or hold it up to the light you can't see through the total thickness of it. And it's only four and a half millimeters thick which I think is about three sixteenth. Okay so uh, onward uh, we've got our file let's get it cut out. Well, that's, uh, that's really impressive. I really love the way these things come out. They, they always look good, and especially when you give it to somebody to have a look at, and then you tell them, they, they look at it and think, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's all right. And you tell them, hold it up to the light, and oh, wow, they've never seen anything like it before. Even though lithophane technology has been around a lot longer than the, uh, the rest of us, that's for sure. Now, if you're using uh, cutters like this here, like I said, uh, you can use one with a broken tip as I did. Uh, just make sure the broken tip isn't too big. About half a millimeter, I wouldn't want it any more than that. You want to keep it nice and small. And you can, as I said, also take a uh, diamond file and just touch up the uh, cutter. Now you need to have a diamond file because these are solid carbide cutters and uh, a normal file will not work with it. It has to be diamond. And if you are going to try and round it over, 
then do it on the back of the cutter here not on the flat surface here that's your cutting edge you do not want to damage that at all the great thing about these here is these are so small um, you can get away with uh, quite a bit with them the uh, you'll also notice that uh, when you look at the cutter I don't know whether it's in focus or not but there's one short diagonal edge and one long diagonal edge now the short one is actually the cutting edge the long one here is the uh, clearance so that doesn't do any cutting it's only this side here that does the cutting so uh, consequently when you put this here into uh, your spindle and give it a spin you might notice that the center seems to wobble off center a little bit and that's perfectly normal for an engraving bit you can of course get uh, tapered uh, ball nose bits uh, but they are very expensive compared to the likes of these here which are uh, very cheap for a packet of 10 you get more than 10 of these here for about the price of one uh, tapered ball nose bit okay now the other thing is if you decide you want to make some of these here I will put uh, the file to the cutout uh, in the write up associated with this video just follow the link in the description box below and if you want to make these here and perhaps sell them at the likes of market days uh, I've got a couple of suggestions for you first of all don't try and sell them in that particular instance as uh, personalized photos you can certainly show them to people like that but uh, you will generally find people will be interested in this as they walk away from your display they'll forget about it uh, and you'll probably never hear from them again even if you did get photos of them uh, and get the money off them uh, at the time uh, you've then got the hassle of cutting them and mailing it to them uh, so if you're going to sell them at something like a market day I suggest getting some sort of a well-known local landmark or something something generic that uh, people in general are interested sort of touristy type things so for instance if you were in uh, Paris for instance uh, you'd perhaps put the Eiffel Tower on it something along those lines just to give you an idea um, if you are going to do people's uh, faces then what you need to do is you need to make sure it's just of a head and shoulders try and get as much of the head and shoulders in as possible and if you're doing it say uh, take a photo of me here then go through and cut me out and just put a blank background in behind and uh, perhaps make it grey a, a flat grey or something like that there that will reduce the cutting time because then it's cutting large flat areas that don't change there's not there won't be as much up and down of the cutter and it will just keep the focus on the person it will look better uh, if you do that so that's just a hint with uh, doing uh, people head and shoulders shots okay well that about wraps it up for this episode I hope you enjoyed it and uh, maybe learn something new in the meantime don't forget to check out my website www.cncnuts.com and uh, I'll catch you guys later. Cheers.